It's aviation's final frontier. <laughs> Cowboy pilots who deliver small, used aircraft. You see how it's leaking through the fuselage? Across distances they were never meant to fly. If it had happened over the Atlantic Ocean, it would have been ugly. That's not good. There's a right way to fly an airplane, and there's a wrong way. And as long as there's money and fuel to burn, we don't care if you spill a little bit. They will fly anything. To this day, when I see some of these airplanes, it's like, wow. Anywhere. Woohoo! I took that plane where it was never meant to go. Anytime. <laughs> Holy crap, we made it. <laughs> At a small airport in Rhode Island, pilots Bob Rasky and Yasmina Platt have run into big trouble. An oil change is a normal thing. We were low on oil anyway. They were hired to jockey a 36-year-old single-engine Cessna from California to Poland, a flight over 10,000 kilometers long that will take them across the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. But the job is starting to look like a suicide mission. First, it was the left flap. Whoa. Look at that thing. Oh, it's not working? Nope. Uh-oh. Then, a fuel leak. Oh, right my here. God. OK, so it is leaking pretty good back there. Yeah, okay. I'm just concerned about electrical fire. We don't need to divert the nearest airport right now. Now, metal filings in the oil filter indicate the engine is falling apart. Oh, my God. Would you feel comfortable flying this across the North no, Atlantic? absolutely not. So what do you North recommend? Atlantic. It's unairworthy. For Bob, this is the third and last strike. He refuses to fly this plane again without a thorough maintenance job. It's actually recommended by anybody ferrying across the North Atlantic to do that at least two to three times before you go, including doing soap analysis. That's recommendations. His boss, Corey Benson, disagrees. That's not how it works. We cannot authorize work on someone else's airplane. Let's say they find something. Are you going to pay to fix it? Because the owner could just as easily say, well, you guys authorize the inspection. I'm not paying for it. You pay for it. And I know sure as hell I'm not going to pay for it. Corey's in the business of delivering planes, not fixing them. But with his hired guns ready to bail, he's got no choice but to talk to the mechanic. Yeah, oh, hold on a second. Here you go. The verdict. The engine needs an overhaul. This plane delivery has already been delayed by a week. And in Poland, the client is running out of patience. We are paying for the Cessna, and we have to pay also the rental uh, aircraft. So we're paying double. That's why we desperately needed uh, that plane. She'll keep losing money until Corey delivers the plane. But now, his pilots have second thoughts about finishing the job. It's uh, easy enough to acquiesce to the fact that we got it here. We got to a certain point. It might be time to hand it off to somebody else. Heading home. Corey's pilots are throwing in the towel. Bob and I have done everything we can, and we've brought it as far as it would let us. It needs another doctor to look at her. They're calling it quits. And Corey's finding out that running a plane delivery business can be more stressful than flying. I don't know what's going to happen. The first thing is it's more delays, period. I mean, it, it, it could be as simple as just a new cylinder they need to put on it. But if it needs a new engine, it's at least two, three weeks. Worse, the grounded Cessna is just half of Corey's nightmare. Now he's got another job to get off the ground and another client who wants the plane delivered yesterday. When the plane's ready, the client expects you to be ready and to leave right then. I cannot tell them that they have to wait another week or two weeks because I'm doing another flight. They want their plane now. And so we have to have other pilots ready to go that are trained in the airplane that can ferry it if I'm busy. Corey thinks he's got the right guy to take on this new job. Carrie McCauley owns a skydiving school in Wisconsin. Over a decade ago, Kerry made his living delivering planes across the globe. And he signed on with Corey to find out if he still got the nerve to do his old job once again. 
I've crossed the ocean many times, flown over Africa, Europe, Middle East. If I screw this one up, all the people that uh, know me and have heard all my glorious stories over the years are going to be uh, snickering behind my back or to my face. That was a blast. I needed that. Carrie might be a little rusty, but he's no rookie. Some pilots, they call the office and call the boss every 10 minutes. They want every decision made for them. They want help. They want their hand held all the way across. There she is. If I don't bother Corey, if I just get the job done with the minimum amount of interference and with the minimum amount of money, he'll be impressed. Good morning, guys. George Johnson. Hey, George. Carrie McCauley. Carrie. Stu Sprung. Stu, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Stu Sprung will be Carrie's co pilot. And this morning, he's meeting the plane for the first time. For me, it'll be definitely uncharted waters. Uh, flying over the Amazon, I'm not quite sure how that's going to make me feel. It's a very low time airplane. It's got about 2,000 hours total time. What year is it? It's uh, 1989. This is a Beechcraft Bonanza. Based on World War II fighter plane technology, the Bonanza has been in production for over half a century. It's a close cousin of the first Bonanza, which killed musicians Buddy Holly and Richie Valens in 1959. You know, it's hard to see problems in some of these planes when they've washed them and waxed them and detailed them like that. Flying a plane for someone else is a lot like a high altitude blind date. The pilots never really know what they're getting into. People have told us this is a great plane, it's in great condition, fresh out of its annual inspection. But I need to see for myself. And sometimes, even the best airplanes have a dirty little secret. You hear that? It sounds like something's rubbing. Yeah, it's loudest right here. Last thing is we need is for one of those rods to wear all the way through and we're halfway over Brazil. They'll need to get this fixed before they can take off. They've got a long flight ahead. Almost 8,000 kilometers from Greensboro, North Carolina, to Porto Alegre in Brazil. So you're saying from St. Bart's to Grenada to Georgetown, and you want to make Macapa in the same day? That's going to be tough. That would have to be a perfect day. That's well, uh, about 1,400 miles. And according to the latest forecasts, the only thing perfect about the upcoming weather is a perfect storm, a monster hurricane lurking on the outskirts of Cary and Stu's flight path. We don't need to have the whole conversation about being pessimistic or optimistic. We're going to yeah, make it. I'm going to do yep. a parallel plan. I'm going to call what it a realistic you... plan. Stu knows that flight plans almost always change. But what's really bugging him is a problem that he can't fix. It just irritates me to even talk, have oh, to even it's... think about it. I mean, ain't that the way it goes? You know, the one big key commitment you have. Stu is a retired firefighter. Every year since the 9-11 terror attacks, he's joined his fellow firefighters for a memorial. And he took this job on one condition, that he could be in New York City for the 10th anniversary. That was a very devastating time. I worked there with the New York City firefighters. Some of my best friends were New York City firefighters that uh, passed away that day. We made a pledge never to forget. And so if I'm not there because I'm flying an aircraft to Brazil, it'll tear away at me. It's just, I just don't even want to have to deal with that. We're a team. Take care of each other. And your well-being is my well-being. That's true. So let's talk about both our well-beings in this freaking hurricane that's bearing down on us. Um, a hurricane of this size could shatter a small plane in a few seconds. So the only way to survive it is to find a way around it. A better boogie. Nice. Yeah, yeah. If Stu has any chance to make it back to New York in time, they have to get to the first stop before the hurricane. Game plan is just trying to get ahead of it. The irony is if to beat the hurricane, we have to fly right at it. Gear up. In Rhode Island, the delivery of a 36-year-old Cessna 206 is in jeopardy. And Corey Benson is here because his pilots walked out. 
Now the boss has no choice but to finish the job himself. I had to drop everything to get out here and finish the flight. So it's frustrating, but my company's reputation is riding on this flight. I got to get the aircraft there. Hey, Joe. Hi, Corey Benson. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet hey, you. Randy. Randy McGee. Welcome to Rhode Island. Nice Corey's to convinced his friend and expert pilot, Randy McGee, to lend him a hand. This isn't the first time Randy has been a lifesaver. He piloted Corey's first delivery, a dangerous flight from California to Australia. Whoa. Slow it down here. OK. In case we run into any bad bumps, we won't break our airplane. Things got a little bumpy over the Pacific. That light means we have 10 minutes left of fuel. I don't want to be freaking swimming in the ocean, dude. They both live to tell the tale. Holy crap, we made it. <laughs> and now, Randy's back for more. How's she look? Oh, she looks pretty good now. I mean, we've changed the engine in it. As far as used engines go, it's, it's about the best you're going to get. I did everything I could, test flying it, running it on the ground. It's all yours now. All right, thanks a lot. Hey, thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. The refurbished engine might give the plane a second life or turn this trip into the last fatal flight. Right. The plane definitely had some major issues, and that's a big red warning light walking into this situation. But I can't let that cloud my evaluation of the airplane right now as the airplane sits there. When Corey and Randy leave Rhode Island, they'll begin a deadly game of hopscotch to get to Poland landing on remote airstrips when their fuel runs low over the cold North Atlantic, where even a small storm can turn the little airplane into a cocktail shaker. That's why both pilots signed up for a two-day survival course before the flight. All right, once you sit down, grab your seatbelt. Yeah, it's a little bit of uh, excitement with some nervousness mixed in there. Yeah, for sure. You're gonna hear me say ditching, ditching, ditching. Ditching is the controlled landing of a plane on water. But for the pilots, it's code for life or death. We're gonna lower down underwater and submerge. Great reference point for you to use to find that jettison handle is the reference right off of your knee. It won't do any good to survive the impact if they can't get out of the plane. And if they don't find that jettison handle, they might never get out. If Corey and Randy go down at sea, after impact, icy cold water will fill the cockpit in seconds. It was a very eerie feeling. Your sinuses fill up, you're disoriented, you have no idea where you're at, you can't see anything. You have to use your position points to, to locate your emergency exit and to get out, all while holding your breath. And if you got in there and didn't have a plan, didn't know what you're doing, I don't think you make it. I can feel that little bit of fear or panic start to creep in a little bit, and uh, it's not a good feeling at all. While the going is still good, Corey wants to take off. If we wait a few more hours, there'll just be embedded thunderstorms in the clouds. So we've got a window of just a short time to get off the ground to be able to make our destination where we'll be stuck somewhere. Ready, cowboy? I'm ready. Today's flight to Goose Bay, Canada will be overland. From there on, it's do or die. Back down south, over the Caribbean Sea. Carrie and Stu are playing chicken with a monster hurricane over 600 kilometers wide. Just off the right of her nose, that's not good. One hour till hurricane time. Carrie's gambling the Beechcraft Bonanza can outrun the storm and leave disaster in his rearview mirror. Got a couple of lightning strikes on the Ahead storm of scope, yep. And there is a big thunderstorm right in front of us. That one right there, that's huge. Yeah. That one there is huge. I just saw lightning. We might be screwed. 
If they can beat the storm, Stu has a chance to make it back to New York for the 9-11 memorial of the terror attacks. If this hurricane delays us by a day, then I'm going to be left with having to make a very difficult decision on whether I can complete the trip or possibly not go to New York. There's some pretty serious airplanes that have been destroyed in the air just by thunderstorm stuff, not a category two or three hurricane. We got to be careful too, though, because we're losing daylight. Yeah, yeah. If we go off course too far, we're going to get there after dark. The six cylinder engine powers the Bonanza to a top speed of over 300 kilometers per hour, and they're knocking off some serious mileage but their flight path is starting to look like a kamikaze mission. The aging Cessna has delivered Randy and Corey safely to their first fuel stop. Now they prepare to go head to head with the unforgiving and potentially deadly North Atlantic. Here we go. Here we go. Dude, my stomach's turning a little bit. What do you mean by that? Just feeling nervous, all right, man. Putting on these survival suits brings home the danger. Reality's setting in. This is a big flight. This is uh, by far the most dangerous flight I've ever done. I just want to stay dry. If the crash doesn't kill them, the cold water will in about 15 minutes. These high-tech survival suits might keep their blood warm and their hearts pumping long enough to get picked up alive by a rescue team. It's gonna be hard to zip these up sitting down, you know? In the tiny Cessna, there's no way and no time to put these suits on in an emergency. So they have to fly half zipped in. The suit is like a full dry suit, and plus it has a liner in there to help keep your body warm. And so they're very bulky, they're hard, they're sweaty on the inside um, because it doesn't allow any water to get in at all. I mean, all the way from your toes up to your neck, you're trapped in that suit. All right, she's climbing nicely. This is no dress rehearsal. It's showtime. No more land. We will not see land for many hours. Probably 99.9% .9 of the people in the world that have never taken a single engine piston across the Atlantic. You know that? What's that say about us? We're badass mofos. The first leg goes without a hitch. Just get us there, old Cessna. They dropped in on a Greenland airstrip and refueled. Now they're back up, looking at more than 1,000 kilometers of white-knuckled flying before their next stop, Reykjavik, Iceland. Headwind's picking up. We just lost five knots in the last five minutes. Down to 122 knots ground speed. It's been 20 hours since they left Rhode Island and they'll be rubbing elbows in this cramped cockpit for at least another five hours before the next pit stop. Your speed just keeps declining. On this flight, it seems something is always going wrong, and they're starting to feel like they're riding in a flying coffin. What's our ground speed? 99 knots. Ground speed is the measure of the Cessna's speed relative to the Earth, and right now, a headwind is slowing down the plane forcing the pilots to burn more fuel than they estimated. But we can't maintain 95, 96 knots ground speed. We won't make it. So we're gonna have to have some seriously improving performance, man, or we're gonna make this gonna be a short trip. If the headwinds keep up at the current rate, their tanks could run dry before they reach their destination. So Corey does the math. Okay, Randy, here's basically what I came up with. It took us 45 minutes to get to cruising altitude. We're right at that hour of fuel reserve with everything staying the same. I mean, it's right on that, it's right on that verge. I don't, I mean. Before this trip, Corey's team built an extra fuel tank to extend the Cessna's range. 
they rigged the homemade 58-gallon tank into the passenger compartment, an additional piece of cargo that gives them enough fuel to cross the Atlantic. But it's like riding in a flying bomb. We can only go out this way for about another 20 or 30 minutes, or we're gonna, and we're gonna have to turn around and go back. I got no choice. But now, even with the extra tank, the fuel levels are running dangerously low, and Randy's getting worried because they're approaching the point of no return. I think whatever we're gonna do, we gotta do it now, figure it out now. The point of no return is a go or no go decision for a pilot. You only have the fuel to go forward, so even if you want to turn around, you can't make it. I want you to look in that tank and tell me what you see. Or maybe I should do it, because I know I've been looking back there. I have a better gauge of how much fuel's in there. OK. I'm going to transfer control to you, OK? You have the airplane. I'm going to unbuckle and go mess with this fuel tank. You have the airplane? Got the airplane. The auxiliary fuel tank doesn't have a gauge, so Randy has to eyeball what fuel is left. This is really difficult with these suits on, man. They're a pain in the ass. Oh, what was that? OK. I'm, I'm taking off the cap. All of a sudden, that thing just flies up. It was like an explosion, man. I took a huge whiff of fumes, man, and I don't feel too good. Fuel under high pressure just blew out of the tank into the cabin. And now it won't take more than a tiny spark to explode. If I could choose one way not to die, it's I don't want to be burned to death. I think it's awful. And in an airplane, if, if you have a fire, it's something that uh, can kill you very quickly. And there's nothing you can do. Those fumes were nasty. All the electronics we got in here, fuel were burned. The vapors explode. And jeez, uh, we got to be careful, man. We got keep this thing well ventilated. Randy cracks open a window to clear out the gas fumes. <laughs> Do you need to check your pants, man? Does it... <laughs> Did you hear me yell? I scream like a little schoolgirl. <laughs> when the fuel tank blew in my face, I was able to, for whatever reason, keep my cool and keep operating that airplane. If you panic and quit thinking, you're dead, period. But it's still a long way to the next pit stop. Back down south in the Caribbean, pilots Kerry McCauley and Stu Sprung are avoiding a fight they were guaranteed to lose by steering the Beechcraft Bonanza around a deadly hurricane. It's going to add about an hour or so under our trip, kind of stretch our fuel a bit. But we kind of got to do it now, because that looks pretty nasty. I don't want to wait until we're right in it. Let's uh, run away and live to fly another day. They veer off to avoid the monster winds and violent rains. Boy, I'm really glad we got that hurricane behind us. I mean, that was a real stress builder. It says uh, St. Martin at 6. Would you say what sunset that was? 7.30. So if we could turn and burn in an hour, be there by 7. No, we'll be there waiting. It's only three hours to St. Martin. Three and a half. The good news is Hurricane Katia won't win this fight by a knockout. The bad news is the detour puts them in St. Martin after dark. And flying blind is never fun. What really gets screwy with these islands at night is completely surrounded with blackness and just this little tiny strip of lights. Oh. St. Martin, finally. Hurricane missed you guys, huh? We're always great when they're lucky when they miss us. Kind of wanted to see it. I want to get a little closer. But yeah, it's not my airplane, so I. <laughs> I should probably take good care of it. The owner might not appreciate hurricane damage. That's right. <laughs> a safe landing makes any day a good day. But Stu has other things and places on his mind. Something will jam us up. I guarantee it. For me, when you get as lucky as we have on this trip, it's almost a sign that something's going to come down the chute and, and screw it all up. Every corner I turn, I'm expecting it. 
Every day, two or three things come up that can cause potential delays. We just don't know what they are until they hit us. Back up north, Corey and Randy are approaching Iceland with 30 minutes of fuel to spare and enough fumes in their jury-rigged tank to blow them halfway to the moon. Wow, Corey, you come a long way on your fuel calculation since Australia. Go f yourself. If Randy is unimpressed by his co-pilot's flight skills, he's not saying too much, because the co-pilot on this flight is also the boss, and he's signing the checks. Let's get out of here, huh? That flight did not disappoint. The wind was terrible. Fuel problem. That just makes it interesting, man. <laughs> That's right. Makes for a good story later, yeah. right? Yeah. As long as you make it. Yeah. <laughs> Small businessmen like Corey don't survive long without learning how to cut a few corners. But there's something about flying a single-engine plane across the ocean that can make even the toughest men think twice. <laughs> this is supposed to be attached, and that, that starts to give me a clue to some of the problems we may have been having while we were having the explosion. Something not right with that. We gotta get a mechanic to take a look at that. If the tank of extra fuel blew its top because it wasn't venting properly, Randy doesn't want that to happen again. It doesn't look good. This thing this is really f***ed up. And, uh, Something you can fix quickly, you think? Well, no, not quickly. You know, we're, we're really trying to get out of here. Yeah, I believe that. So, Randy and the mechanic both know they'll need at least a day or more to make the fix and to do it right. But for Corey, it's another crippling setback. He's over a month behind on the delivery of this plane. His reputation is on the line. You gotta get the plane to the client, and there's a chance we're gonna be here three or four days. As for Randy, he's willing to do whatever it takes to deliver the plane safely, even if it means pulling rank on his co-pilot and boss. Way down south in the tropics, close to the equator, Carrie and Stu's Beechcraft Bonanza is 24 hours away from reaching their final destination, and their spirits are high. Is this an old ferry trick, ferry pilot trick that you have with the GPS? If we got a ditch in the ocean, I would like to ditch in front of a cruise ship because we'd be in the hot tub with a margarita within the hour. Where do I shut off the gas? <laughs> These pilots only met a few days ago, but the adventure has already turned them into old friends. It doesn't always work out that way. Hey. Two pilots are flying together and their personalities don't click, it's really gonna be a problem. 36 hours shoulder to shoulder with another guy will not be a lot of fun if you don't get along. You have a great sense of humor, shrug off the problems and just keep flying. You'll have a great trip and you'll make a great ferry pilot. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to get some gas, file a flight plan, and hopefully make this stop less than an hour. They're halfway through today's flight plan. If things keep going along, they'll reach Brazil by sundown. All right, fueled up, ready to go. Flight plan's filed. Not so fast. Either having issues with the registration for this plane, and they can't get permission for us to land in Brazil so we can't take off. <laughs> On any other flight, a delay like this would be no big deal. But Stu has made it clear from the start. He promised his firefighter brothers he would be in New York for the 9-11 memorial, even if it means abandoning his captain today. Hey, Corey, it's Stu. How you doing? So nothing from even the FAA, right? This should have been done two weeks ago. Why do they wait till we're <laughs> moments from entering Brazil to say, oh, hey, hey, by the way, we... Literally didn't... about to take off. Why boss Corey didn't get the Brazilian paperwork done is a mystery. But if Stu bails out now, Corey will need a lot more than paperwork. He'll need a new pilot. This is the delay that can't happen. This is not a small leg. It's not a leg that we can make up the next day. This is a whole day right here down the tubes. We did make it through a hurricane but we can't make it through Brazilian paperwork. <laughs> no pilot lands in a foreign country without permission. 
unless he's looking for free room and board. Yeah, I don't feel like going to the Brazilian jail. The only thing about that is they'll probably only take one of us to jail. Yeah, but well, they I'll always take the pretty one. <laughs> I'll make sure, I'll, get you, I'll bring you some smokes in prison. Boy, I love you, man. You're always thinking of me, my well-being. I, I know. How, how can you make me comfortable in a Brazilian prison? Man, I'm touched. I'm, I'm so touched <laughs> that you were thinking of me. How's it going? All that's left to do is kill time in town and hope for news from the office before it's too late. Oh, 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 oh. Gary, you're going to love this. What? It's currently Independence Day in Brazil. So I'm having a hard time getting in touch with anybody. No way. <laughs> but Stu doesn't have to say what they both know all too well. Time is running out fast. Corey and Randy have flown more than halfway across the frozen North Atlantic seas. And after being grounded for 48 hours in Iceland for repairs, the two of them are just dying to fly. All right, buddy, it's game time. Let's get pulled up and let's get out of here. Okay. Gotta try and make up some of the time. And Corey's got a lot to make up. It's game day. We need to get this plane down to Poland. We have a job to do. The, the clients are waiting for us. Assuming that the weather is cooperating, we'll be in the air early and we'll, we'll get going. The next leg will stretch the range of the old Cessna 206. Once again, they'll be relying on that homemade fuel tank, and Randy wants to make sure it doesn't explode again. This flight's no joke. We've got about 600 miles of open ocean. We can't let down our guard now, because if this flight's taught you anything, the unexpected is, is going to happen. The next leg is a six-hour journey to Scotland across the unforgiving North Atlantic. It's a lot of time in a single-engine plane with no place to land if anything goes wrong. We should already be there by now. Corey's flying the same plane, but he's being driven by a different kind of engine, the money machine. You gotta move quick. The wind's getting stronger. Let's go. Let's do it. To Randy, Corey sounds less and less like a co-pilot and more and more like a nervous businessman. He's got to realize that flying, there's no mistakes. We got one shot at it. Hey, listen, I'm going to fly this leg. You haven't been taking this flight seriously enough. I want to drive that point home with you, OK? So you're not going to fly this leg. I'm going to fly it until you start taking it a little more seriously. Whatever you want. Corey might be the boss but Randy puts his foot down. This is one business where a shortcut can lead to disaster. Got a checklist. Seatbelt stores and locks. In the tropical heat of Guyana, Carrie and Stu have finally received authorization to land on Brazilian soil. We've gotten the proper paperwork. Uh, CB was able to uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat. They're a full day behind schedule, and Stu's appointment with the New York 9-11 Memorial is coming up fast. All right, let's get the show on the road. Today doesn't go perfect. He's not going to be able to finish a trip and get to New York on time. Gear up. Gear up. Carrie is determined to do whatever it takes to make Stu finish the job. That's why he's decided to fly 2,700 kilometers from Georgetown, Guyana to Goiânia, Brazil, with just one fuel stop. Wow, what is that? It's like a huge, there's a cliff there. Huge cliff and yeah. some, wow, this is cool. This is the kind of flight that can remind even the most jaded pilot why he fell in love with flying. Look Back. at this, holy cow, that's huge. The whole thing just looks like it's out of the last world or something. Look at that. Wow. Unbelievable. Pretty impressive. Oh my god, awesome. You know, this is why I fairy fly. Who else gets a chance to do this? I got a new high point in my life. That was... <laughs> That was cool.
Over a thousand kilometers later, they drop into Macapá for refueling and customs clearance. But there's a problem. Customs apparently is closed for the day, mm -hmm. so that can't be done. The runway is closed from 8 to noon for they're working on the runway, 8 to noon tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, really? I mean... <sighs> it's the bad news Stu had feared all along. I have to say I'm a little uh, speechless right now. There's no effing way I'm going to be able to make it from here to anywhere else and make it to New York. This is my last stop. I'm done. For Stu, this flight is over. But he still has to break the news to his boss, Corey, who's now flying as co-pilot on the flight to Poland. It's the big blow that we were hoping wouldn't happen. Up north, Corey and Randy reach the green highlands of Scotland. After flying the shaky Cessna over thousands of kilometers of treacherous ocean, the rolling hills below their wings have let them forget about their differences. Well done, Capitan. By the time we landed, I was really excited and like, wow, that was great. By the time we parked that airplane, I had tanked. I was really tired, um, just uh, really almost not even thinking quite straight anymore. They might be exhausted, but Corey isn't wasting any time. He's determined to keep moving. You have to have incredible stamina to do this type of flying. We put in a lot of hours in the cockpit every day. We don't get a ton of sleep, and we're expected to get up and do it the next day. Sometimes, a pilot has nothing left to run on but sheer willpower. That's very physically challenging. Jumping time zones, being at altitude where the air is less, and so that takes a physical toll on you. It knocks you on your ass sometimes. <laughs> that was a good one, dude. It, man, I'm like fighting it hard over here. Corey wants to be in Poland before sunset. Next is the final destination into uh, Poland. It's a little grass strip that we're going to be delivering the airplane to, so we've got to hurry and turn and burn and, and get it there. So, almost done. One more leg left. That gives him just two hours to get the Cessna ready for takeoff. But Randy has just discovered they might need a little more time. We have a strut problem. Our strut's starting to give us some issues. So need a few minutes to think it over and uh, do a little further investigation on the airplane and, and a little closer look at the weather. And then, uh, then I'll make a decision whether we're going to go or not. The strut connecting to the front landing gear is leaking oil. It's not bad enough to ground the Cessna, but if landing conditions aren't perfect, on touchdown, it could make the plane hard to handle, and Randy isn't going to chance it. At our destination, which I just found out is a grass field, uh, we're supposed to have rain showers and winds gusting 20 knots, gusting to 35 knots. That may keep us here for another day. Randy knows that even without the faulty strut, a soggy runway and a strong crosswind could snap the Cessna's landing gear. Right now, we're not sure the plane's ready. We're not sure the weather's going to be good enough, so. We need to get going, though. I mean, we have to we have to get it there tonight. We don't have to do anything. If it gets too late, we'll just have to stay. Corey may be the boss, but Randy's word is law, and he's not backing down. A few hours later, Corey catches a lucky break. Where I think we can go. Really? Yeah, I think it's looking good. Let's get the hell out of here. All right. The weather cleared, so Randy said OK to setting out on the final leg to Poland. Randy, it's going to be interesting when we land here in a couple minutes. I know, man. We don't know what to expect. I mean, she could be really upset with us. She could be really happy. We don't know. Now that they'll be landing soon, their thoughts have turned to their last and potentially biggest problem. 
one hard-nosed, no-nonsense Polish customer. I think she's just extremely frustrated with the situation because this plane was supposed to be here almost a month ago. Hey, Corey, we're almost there. Let's do it right. All right, boss. There is a concrete strip right there. The concrete runway should be a lot safer than a dirt strip. Yeah, it's concrete, but it's all broken up. It's pretty cracked. But there's only one way to find out if the leaky strut can absorb the shock of a bumpy landing. And now that the new owner is watching their final approach, they'd better put on a good show. All right, Corey, this is it. Speed's looking good, everything's looking good. I just hope this runway surface is good. thing the customer is only watching from a distance because it's one rough landing but the gear holds up nice well done, job, bro. Well done. Hello. Congratulations, we finally got it here for you. Thank There's the you keys. So much. How are you? I'm Corey I'm Benson. Fine. Nice Hello. to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. We brought you a little present. Thank you. As well as the plane that <laughs> you've been is, waiting for forever. This huh? is my present. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Her skydiving school has been hemorrhaging money on the rental of another plane. But now that she's got her Cessna, she'll soon be out of the red. And that means Corey finally has a happy customer. We definitely uh, went through a lot for them, and uh, you know that's our job, and um, we're happy to do it. Well, it's better late than never. We yeah. got her here safely. <laughs> <laughs> when we finally land, and they're frustrated because it's a few days late, it's like, wait a minute, we just we just put our lives in our hand. We just crossed the ocean in a single-engine piston, and come on. Way down south in the tropics. Hey, Corey, it's Stu. How you doing? Carrie and Stu's yeah, mad race right against right time right has come right to an abrupt stop. Uh, we just landed in Makapa. Uh, customs was closed early, so we can't do any customs until tomorrow morning at 8. And the runway is closed for maintenance from 8 until noon tomorrow. Stu is on the phone with boss Corey who's just landed in Poland, and he's giving Corey the bad news. He's bailing out. That basically killed him, so yeah, I'd be committed to leaving from here. So you're, you're gonna come all the way down here to take my spot? Stu is going to New York to the 9-11 Memorial, and Corey is flying into Makapa to replace him, which means Carrie is temporarily grounded. You're kidding me, are she? Am I forbidden to continue on? Can I meet him at the next stop? I mean, for me to sit here with a good airplane and good job. The way Stu tells it, he held up his part of the bargain, but he's still splitting up the team and leaving a job unfinished. It's tough for me to leave you because I'm worried that's leaving you stranded. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. I yeah, will probably be easier. I won't have to listen to your boring stories. And... All right. I've done tons of trips like these, and far more dangerous, far more difficult by myself. To have someone come down here to help me for the last, uh, third of the trip is really unnecessary and just drives me nuts to have to wait. Next time on Dangerous Flights, Corey steps in to finish the job and Carrie puts him to the test. This is definitely not the job for a would-be pilot. 
while Randy takes on his toughest challenge yet, flying into war-torn Africa in a type of plane he's never flown before. Company off the races manual is there. That's a lot of reading. So you're an airline pilot, man. You'll figure it out.